Um, so in terms of uh, just a bit of background, I came from uh, Puppet, so I'm a DevOps guy, automation guy. Uh, the title of the, the talk I kind of borrowed from a couple of different places. Um, so Teradata uh, and Heroku and a couple of other uh, data guys use this um, byline a lot. Um, I believe it came from data is the new bacon and then somebody changed it to data is the new tofu. Um, basically referring to the fact that, look, it's everywhere, it's everything, um, and it can be everything for everybody. A um, couple of motivations for this talk. Um, basically, you know, people do event-based programming and they move to it. They don't really think about it. It's like automation back in the day. Uh, DevOps, agile, automation, serverless, like things that kind of creep into our ecosystem organically and grow because they have value. It's the same thing with data. Um, a lot of things these days uh, is data-driven. In fact, everything is. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, the Great Hack documentary that's on Netflix. Um, the first line out of that documentary is like, data is worth more than oil. Um, and it is. Um, it's becoming even more um, valuable these days because if you have somebody's data, you have effectively their purchasing footprint, their you know, biomedical footprint, just about everything. Um, the other thing is like um, everything changes all the time, like especially in our industry, in IT, um, you know, data is becoming the new in thing. It's like doing things with data. And now AI is becoming the new in thing, like look at chat, you know, the chat GPT thing. Uh, but if you think about it, like without data, those things are kind of useless. Um, data is going to be effectively um, the most powerful thing that you see over the next couple of, I think, you know, decades. The other reason I do this is basically this slide like always makes me laugh. Um, and it kind of encompasses what we do a lot. You know, sometimes we're so busy running things, we don't take time to stop and look at, you know, things that could be done better, iterations. Like, we, I know we have retros and stuff like most people do these days, like when you have uh, Agile Ops retros, but really, like, how many times do you turn around and go, hey, my tooling isn't great or my tooling sucks, so I'm going to fix it. Uh, what could I be doing better? Um, and look, I'm a vendor, and sometimes, <clears throat> you know, when you have that conversation with customers, you know, customers kind of like, oh, yeah, like, we don't really do enough uh, deep diving into our retros. Um, and if you ask people how often they, you know, do inspection of how they're using their data and how they're doing their patterns, you'll find that the answer is uh, we, we don't do that sort of stuff. We look at our tools, but we don't really look at things like data lineage and how we could be improving our data usage. We don't look at, you know, um, our data flow. Um, also, you know, how people self-service data. Um, these things tend to be ignored, and that's kind of why I like this slide. Um, go from my uh, background, but um, I used to be a Java developer with us uh, also, so I've, I've, I've gone through a fair bit of stuff. A um, couple of ideas. Uh, there you, oh, there'll be no questions. Just hang on a second. So I just had to grab a drink of water. Um, so there's a guy called Neil Avery who used to work for Confluent. He's published most of these ideas um, in a four-part blog. Um, and we'll give you the link after this. Um, Kai Werner's blog as well, <clears throat> data streaming versus APIs. Um, I call it the frenemies blog. Um, he does it also, I think. It's basically, um, you don't have to have one or the other. They're, they're better together. Um, also, this is not a big data versus fast data conversation. This is about fast data. Um, this is kind of a change your ecosystem or the way you look at data approach rather than, you know, this is the way you have to do stuff. Um, it's more of a, hey, you should look at doing this. So this is the agenda. Um, it's about 20 slides. Hopefully, keep it to 20, 25 minutes. Um, we'll look at what, it, what are events and how they matter. Uh, adopting the events, uh, what data, um, event-driven data architecture is, um, the patterns that you'll notice uh, when consuming and producing data. And I use those words deliberately because that's a that's a Kafka thing when you produce and consume. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, the cost and benefits, and I'm not talking about financial costs. I'm talking about operational burdens as well as you know um, the cost of not doing something properly. Um, and because people like to talk about microservices, we'll talk about scaling, persistence, and microservices. 
Um, we'll also talk about the future of APIs. Um, I'm not a big fan of APIs, and that might be sacrilege to some people. Um, APIs are kind of request response. That's not the way you should be doing things. You should be doing things. An event happens, something should happen in response to that event. An API puts the onus on you to go and fetch the data, as in you've got to go and make a, a, an API request or continuously poll an API. And that's not, yeah, um, I'm not a fan of that methodology. Um, we can talk about why during question time if you have questions. So let's talk about what is an event. Um, look, uh, in the era of big data, uh, it took us a long time to realize, hey, an event needs to be captured at the time that it happens and something needs to happen um, effectively almost immediately. And that's why I say fast data versus big data. Um, I'll give you a really simple example. Let's say you're at the checkout at Coles. This is the first time you're going through uh, a checkout and you're First time you're purchasing things like pet food, a dog leash, um, you scan your flybys card, you start swiping stuff for your new pet. At the time of, of the scanning, um, what should happen is Coles is looking at your data, something is watching your transactions real time, and it sees your data and it says, okay, puppy food, leash, toys, this guy's just bought a dog or this girl's just bought a dog. Uh, or this person's just bought a dog. Um, what we should be doing is making them an offer on our lines of business like pet insurance or you know other types of pet food or you know some sort of loyalty thing that's associated to the purchase that you've just done because your data footprint has just told uh, this this supermarket that you know all of a sudden you've got a ten year commitment with a with an animal. Um, in the old days, what would happen is this would go into database, something would batch out like overnight, like an ETL and extract, extract, transform and load. And then overnight you'd get this email that says, hey, you might want to go and buy this stuff. By which stage it's too late. You've left the supermarket. Um, you've got to go back and, you know, um, basically go and purchase the, the new stuff that they've offered to you. Like that's called effectively lost, lost sale. The same thing happens, you know, in, in a web cart, in a web application, when you remove an item from your cart real time, there are things that should happen to induce you to re-add you know, that item, like we'll give you a discount if you re-add it, that sort of stuff. Um, fundamentally, events like help um, customers and you know, points of sale, like everybody effectively in real time. If you're not capturing the event real time, your, your business is not reacting fast enough. Um, and that's where everything's moving these days. Basically, um, the long way to describe what is an event is it's a thing that has importance to your line of business, right? So it's, if you're in a supermarket, it's a purchase of an item or it's you physically looking at an item or picking something up and looking at it. Um, inside a web application, it could be browsing a particular item, adding it to your cart, um, basically condensed and distilled. An event is um, a business action that is important to your business, right? Something that could be converted into a sale or, you know, uh, metadata about your user, metadata about your product. Um, could be something as simple as how long does somebody take to, to look at this product um, and how quickly they decide to buy it. But yeah, an event is something that has particular importance to your business. So we've, we've covered like why events matter. I talked about the Coles example and I've talked about the, um, the web card example. But you know, an event can also be something predictive um, so let's talk about like a predictive event. Um, so in terms of AI, so let's let's pretend for a second I've got a, a fleet of trucks um, and they all run like refrigeration, cooling, um, and they're all the same truck. They all have the same components. Um, somebody goes into the truck and is about to make a delivery. Uh, trucks usually get serviced every thousand kilometers, and this thing has uh, has done like let's say nine hundred kilometers, and it's about to do a five hundred kilometer drop off. So the first thing is like the predictive event should say, hey, look, this truck is not suited. It hasn't you know, been serviced or it's going to need to be serviced midway through your run. Um, you know, basically do predictive analysis on something that's going to happen to you that's going to affect your business outcome. And that's another reason like um, why events matter. It's, it's not just clicks. It's not just consumer related. It's things like your assets, your inventory, uh, things that sell like predictive analysis. The thing that we just talked about here is like a really simple AI example. Um, basically, like the concept is 
something that's going to affect your business downstream. Um, and again, like I'm just using this as an example of something that's not related to a sale, but that is a business event that's related to your to your outcomes. Um, effectively, this is a, a, about to occur or this has occurred and you better deal with it quickly. Um, and this is why I'm not a fan of APIs. Like an API can't, can't predict an event for you. It can, like if you ask it to, but how are you going to know this thing's going to happen? Um, you know, basically beforehand, you'll have to poll and you'll have to make, you know, the prediction yourself. Uh, it's kind of a very simple example and rather convoluted to make it look like APIs aren't great, but I'll, I'll flesh this out a little bit later. Um, but yeah, basically this is why, you know, events matter and this underpins the whole thing of it needs to be real, it needs to be fast, um, it needs to be real time, sorry. It needs to be fast, it needs to have value and meaning and you need to be able to do something with it. Events don't just don't occur and you do nothing with it. It's something that you consume and it's something that you produce that gives you an, an outcome. So let's talk about um, DDD, which is domain driven design. Uh, basically, um, this is relating to your, you know, transactionality, execution, security lineage and source lineage, meaning you can identify the source of an event. Um, you can identify the source of, of an event. There's things like security, like who can see this event, who can consume this event, um, execution, what are you going to do with the event when it happens? And the most important thing about one of these things um, in terms of business, and this is data at a high level, it's like, do you know what to do with this, with this event when you've consumed it? Um, there's something inside of, of, of Cafe and Comfort called Schema Registry that defines what an event looks like. But there's also something called data lineage that shows what preceded it and what birthed the event and where the event goes to die or what consumes the event. And so all these things uh, are related. Um, trans transactionality, I think um, I'll explain that. Basically, it means an atomic transaction. And I don't mean in terms of like the ACID database concept. Uh, what is it? Uh, atomicity, consistency. I forget what I is. And D is like dur durability. Um, it's, it's very different than that. Basically, it means um, an event happens, a transaction happens, and you can identify the transactions that have happened from that event. But that comes from like lineage and source. Um, these are really, really powerful uh, principles. And this becomes like immediately um, ingrained in things like microservices. Because if you have microservices where your LOB and your functions are separated and your data flies from microservice to microservice, imagine not knowing you know, what birthed an event from a microservice, what consumed it, and what birthed something else out of it. And this is why like lineage and security and source uh, are fairly important. Um, like there's a couple of questions you should ask yourself when you're designing an event. It's like, do I want to ensure transactionality? How do I trust the execution? How do I trust security? Where did it come from? What's the lineage? Where does it, you know, what birthed it? Where does it go to die? Uh, these questions are always important when you're designing events. Um, you should always keep this at the back of mind. Um, let me just escape for a second and see if we've got questions. Uh, so we've got chat. Just bear with me. Uh, no, no questions. No questions. Okay. Okay, so you might ask yourself, how do you design and how do you solve uh, for these for these events? The good news is CNCF, which is Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation, have already started on this. It's called uh, Cloud Events. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's way past point two. I could be wrong. It's been a while since after I updated this. But when you actually create an, uh, an event, the basic attributes should be time, source, key, header, metadata, and payload. Payload meaning the stuff you want to capture, like in a traditional database table, like for users, user ID, first name, surname, address, gender, date of birth, password, that sort of stuff. But on top of that, you're also capturing things like source, where did this data come from? The key, as in like the database key traditionally, but rather the, the, the key in which you address this payload, the header, um, the header could be a whole bunch of stuff, metadata as well as, you know, things like the application it came from, the time, um, the application birth, the, the time it was sent, the expectation of who's going to be consuming this, 
uh, and metadata is just basically data around the payload. Um, one of the problems with like uh, data in general is data is everywhere and it lacks consistency because people will just throw data at something um, and capture it like without meaning. The whole point of cloud events is to give your data value and meaning. Um, so you know when you're capturing user data, you know where the user data came from. Like think about it like this: the data source key, which is the, the thing that owns the data. So, you know, it could be your SAP application, your Oracle application, um, your source of truth, basically. Um, as, and as the data goes downstream um, and you need to do things like lineage, you know where it came from, so you can go back and trace your data. Um, this is something that's fairly important that I've found that's very useful, um, the concept of the data source key. Um, but this is all in CNCF. So I'd urge you to go and look at this. I can talk about this for like 20 or 30 minutes and I won't bore you because it's, like it's very, very heavy, uh, but it's very valuable, especially when you're designing for data. Um, so the other thing is events don't exist in, in isolation. They're all related to something. So let's, if we go back to the example where I'm at the checkout, so it's not an isolated event when I'm purchasing something. The reason I'm purchasing something is because an event happened, right? Like I just bought a pet or I just inherited a pet. Um, and the events themselves, as in I'm purchasing dog food, dog leash, or, you know, whatever, they're all related to each other. Um, so it's a stream or a sequence of events. Uh, it could be anything from like tracking pricing change, uh, device metrics like temperature fluctuating uh, during the day, humidity. Um, and the whole point of it is like because it's a stream, uh, it tends to be behavioral. Behavioral is like effectively a set of facts that happen in a particular order. Um, and this is one of the fundamental things of AI, right? The reason AI is predictive is because these set of events happen and then these things usually happen afterwards. Um, let me give you a real example of that. So we've got a, um, a web customer, let's say they're a big retail outlet. Um, they can predict um, within three clicks your behavior based on the stuff they throw in front of you. So if you fit a certain profile, if they give you three items in your click stream, if you click on them in a particular sequence, they can guarantee that the fourth click is going to be a purchase. Now, it's not really obvious uh, unless you're doing things like statistics and analysis, but what it says is basically data is a stream of data and all of it is related to each other. Um, you can figure out who this uh, end user is. It's, it's pretty easy. But at the same time, like that for them is a huge business win. If, they can feed you three things that you click on in a, in a sequence, uh, your fourth click is gonna be a purchase. So you can imagine the power of these things like data in terms of uh, sequencing and ordering in a, in a stream can give you the outcome that you want. Um, it's not really obvious, but it's, it's important. Um, surprised I haven't got any questions so far, nothing so far. Uh, not yet, nothing that I've seen. I'll let okay, you go. Um, that's fine. Um, okay, so let's cover how traditional uh, data is moved uh, from silo to silo, from, from application to application. This is how it used to be, right? All these point-to-point -point integrations. So what you've got is like this giant data warehouse, every application with their database, dumping their data into the data warehouse through an ETL overnight usually. And then you've got these point-to-point -point integrations here between this. We have a, a term for this. It's, it's called spaghetti or spaghetti code because basically what happens is you've got these batch operations dumping stuff into there real time. Now, this is the old way of doing stuff, uh, things. Um, it's, it's really old. It's really hacky. It's really slow. Um, good luck getting this to work within the space of a day. These ETLs, as you put more and more data in there, is going to take longer and longer because every night, what happens is it redumps the data, rejoins the data. You know, there could be things like caches in front of it. It's it's just a horrible mess. Now, the the way we espouse people do it is basically what you need is a streaming data backbone, um, and what that means is uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, I'll talk you through it. So effectively, when a bit of data hits the streaming backbone here. Um, because of the fact that you're consuming data, it goes to wherever it needs to go um, at once. So write once, um, 
deploy everywhere at any point in time. So if I was to make a purchase in here, all these downstream systems would get a copy of it. And that's what we call consume. And then, you know, when I write something in there, that's what's called produce. So it, it's basically, if you're familiar with PubSub, PubSub at scale, but that's kind of a simplification of it. Fastest way to think about it is um, you're doing your micro batching and your transformations all in real time. So if I write something there, this thing expects data in a particular format, it'll get it in its format, as will application two, three, four, and the data warehouse and Hadoop and whatever else is hanging off the stream in the backbone. But the whole premise of it is you write once into here and it drops it everywhere um, and everybody has access to it real time. So you know, you're not waiting overnight to, to perform your operations. Now, when you're moving to, to event first, there's a couple of things you, you need to think about. Is your, your event observable? Which means, can people see it who need to see it? Uh, is it trusted? Does it have a, a, a transactional format? Effectively, you know, do people know what kind of payload they're getting? Is it stateless? Now that's gonna sound really weird because I said data is in, is in a stream and it's all related to each other, which is true. A stateless meaning I can drop one piece of data um, with context, right? Context, uh, contextless doesn't mean stateless. Um, stateless meaning it's in isolation. Can I grab it uh, and not have to, to fiddle with it? Um, so you need to think about that as well. Do I need to cleanse it? Do I need to enrich it? Um, all these things are kind of related. But again, context is important, which is if it, let's, let's just go back. One of the things I was speaking about before. So here, you know, things like source, key, header, metadata, and payload. This is context to your data, but your data needs to be stateless. Um, as in, you know, it can be consumed um, autonomously uh, without having to consume the thing before and the thing after. Um, this is where things get tricky. If you need to have stateful data, like as in ordered data, um, it still needs context, but it needs to have a reference to the data that comes before and the data that comes after, as in a sequence number or something of that nature. Um, transactions per second, this is um, fairly important. It's like scaling and whatnot in terms of volume, but like things like Kafka take care of this behind the scenes for you. You kind of don't need to worry about this if you're using Kafka. Uh, error handling, uh, and dead letter queue is basically what I'm referring to there. Those two things are related. So if somebody tries to write a piece of data but only manages to write half the payload, do you just ignore it or do you put it into a dead letter queue? Um, you'll find that you know, in terms of um, databases and stuff like that in the past, like if you don't meet a constraint, you just spit out an exception and you get on with your life. This is very different. Like when you're writing you know, data in, in terms of like message queues and whatnot, you need to be able to have a dead letter queue because sometimes you know, life gets in the way like, Server may go down, may not write the entire payload, but you still need like proof, or you still need the fact that this data was attempted to be written to your um, to your message bus or to your streaming back home. Uh, metadata we talked about the context stuff uh, and data lineage, where it came from, where it needs to go to, that sort of stuff. Cool. Hey Sanmi, there's a question yep. from Gavin. Uh, so the question is: In the streaming diagram you had on there. Um, is the app having a transactional database which it's which it persists to, and then the app is dropping an event to the stream with the change it made? Um, so that's a really good question. Let me just go back to my uh... right. So let me let me kind of elaborate on on what um, data is and what what data is in this. So in a database, right, in all these databases, with the exception of, of Hadoop, which is the data warehouse and the actual large data store, everything that talks to a traditional database only has one view of data. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, I've moved house uh, in the last year, something of that, in that nature. That database is only going to have my current address, right? Because that's all it knows. And at that point in time, um, snapshot is what's in the database table, right? In Kafka in a streaming log, it's a continuous commit log. Every time I make a change, all the data is captured. So send me at like data marker zero 
will be my original address, send me a data marker one will be my new address. And there's a thing called uh, effectively an offset, which is a needle where the data, um, where I'm reading from, I can move that needle to any point in time and read, read that data. In databases, this is called like a redo log or an undo log or whatever it is, or a transaction log. Um, to get to that though, is, is not something that uh, an application can ask a database. An administrator has to roll back the transaction and go back and get it. Whereas in here, the application can go into this data background and go, okay, what's Sandy's address you know, at data point eight and what's, what was it at data point zero? Because it's all captured in a completely you know, uh, stateless fashion, meaning all the data is captured at any point in change. So if I change my address, my first name, my middle name, my last name is also captured and stored, right? And whereas in the database, it's the update, the change to the field. And this is what makes this thing so important because the concept of data, a data stream changing over time, like it sounds trivial, changing my address. But let's say I change my address every 12 months, right? And what happens is I take my shopping habits to my new address every 12 months. Somebody can use that information and say, okay, he's going to move to this area in 12 months. And we can say to this, this vendor or this shopping center, this person with this shopping habits is going to move into your, your suburb. Uh, you should be prepared for him. This is the kind of stuff that he's going to be after. Like that's a really convoluted example, but think about it in terms of, uh, you know, other, other habits and other data. That's why like, it's, it's not a either or with databases and, and streaming solutions like Kafka. It's the best, like you should be using both to, to leverage everything you can from it. Um, that, that was a good question, by the way. Um, it, it, it's kind of courses for courses. One solves one problem, the other one solves the other problem. An application may not necessarily want to know about every you know, single time I've changed my address, but the business will. Right. Yeah. So there's a follow up on Gawain, which is, I think, a good one as well. So in that case, are you expecting the app would perform two transactions? First one is write the current state to the transactional database, then write the record of change to the stream. All right. Um, so there's something within um, Kafka called Kafka Connect that automatically takes care of that. The minute you publish uh, data into the stream, it will write it to the database or update the database as it needs to be. Um, that's what makes it so powerful. You don't need to worry about writing to the app and to the data stream. If you write to the data stream, it'll write to the app or you can do it vice versa as well. Um, but yeah, um, you don't have to, to worry about that. The technology takes care of it. Cool. Um, and if you don't mind, I have one question. <laughs> so you mentioned observable. So just can you tell us a little bit about what, what, what does observable in a eventing and data sense mean? Like how do you do observability in this scenario? Okay. So let's, um, stay with me. let me use this as an example. Um, so in this example, we've got microservices and data as a backbone. So let's treat each one of these as a separate application because this is what they're supposed to look like. So if microservice from department one writes to the event backbone, department three should be able to retrieve that event, which is what observable means. Like it's effectively democratization of data. Anybody who wants it should be able to retrieve it and do what they want with it. And this is the entire thing, right? Like in the past, uh, application developers, developers in general, write code for themselves, right? They write something that produces a bit of data and the person who, who services that bit of data or consumes that bit of data is them. Whereas in the new world, when I write a piece of data, I basically publish it into the backbone within parameters and I say, okay, this is a, a bit of user data. This is what you can expect from it. First name, last name, address, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you want it, this is where it's coming from, this microservice in this backbone and you basically it's called subscribe. You subscribe to the user's topic. Every time I write to that topic, you'll get notified as well. Here's a new user. Um, the term observable means I can self-service. And this is the other thing that marries to this as well. It's like an inversion of control. So rather than you know somebody saying to me, can you give me your, your user data? I make it public. If you want user data, subscribe to this topic. This is the format that you can expect from it. What you do with it is your problem. I don't really care. 
but this is the format I'm going to publish it in. Um, so observable basically means if somebody can come to your your topic or your field of responsibility, effectively the data that you're responsible for, consume it and use it as they need to, rather than you know you dumping it into their database and then they're doing what they want with it. Um, so you publish data to the wider world, and whoever wants it can do what they want with it. Um, okay, cool. That makes sense. Thanks for that. That's okay. Um, yeah, so basically, this is like one of the, the first premises of event first. When you publish an event, anything that, that wants to use it um, should be able to. So in, in here, we've got microservices, we've got you know functions as a service. There could be like a database hanging off the end here, uh, consuming the data. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's basically um, you know being able to democratize data, uh, putting it into into your, your domain or your, um, you know, your business domain and letting people just use it as they see fit. So there's um, event first and event command. So uh, this is a, a fairly um, good way to describe it as a concept. So I walk into a room and I generate an event that says I've entered the room and the lights turn on as a response to that event. So the event command analog of that is I walk into the room and I turn on the light switch. And if you think about it, there's one of those is inherently better than the other, and the other one is is like the old way of doing things. So, you know, if you were to walk into every room and you would have to have to write the flip the light switch command, that's really not optimal, right? If you walk into every room and an event is generated that says I've walked into the room, and as a result of that, the light turns on. You've, you've basically solved, you know, the walking into the room, turning on the light thing for, for every situation. The, the analog, um, the event first analog is basically what we described with, you know, making data uh, available to everybody. So democratization of data, making the event available, I've walked into a room to everybody, means they can do what they want with it. You know, turn on the light, turn on the aircon, turn off the light, you know, set off an alarm, that sort of stuff which is you know, the value in inherently saying, hey, this is an event, uh, this is a business event. If you care about like these kind of business event, you should be consuming it and doing it as you see fit. Um, kind of conscious of the time, uh, 6.42. I'll go through this um, and then we'll go through questions. Um, so in this, in this particular use case, um, we've got a, if you think about these as microservices, uh, purchase processor, uh, inventory management, account management, logistics, notify. These are different domains, right? Like these are subdomains of my entire domain. My domain is like sales, yeah? Um, each, each person or rather each department has their own responsibility. If in the purchase processor, I have an event created called reserve item, an event created called take funds, an event created called ship, an event created um, called notify user. And these two things might be uh, correlated. The minute somebody creates, or rather creates a reservation for an item, I basically say, somebody's purchased this. Because inventory management cares about purchases because they need to replenish inventory, they're listening to that event happen, right? So what happens is I put this out into, into the domain. I can do basically things like take their funds, tell logistics I'm shipping the item or rather create a logistics event and the logistics event will take care of it, um, create a notify event, which is basically a purchase. What happens is as these events get created, these different subdomains do what they need to do and I really don't need to care about it because what will happen is inventory will reorder a new item if they need to, uh, account management will charge this person, logistics will ship the thing where it needs to go, um, and the notification service will basically notify them. Like it's, it seems fairly logical, but when you think about it in terms of like creating an event, I create an event, I put it into the data background and we go back, and the other market services consume it and they do what they need to do with it, right? So it's a rather unique way to th think about things, but this is the evolving way to, to think about this. Um, Single sort, yeah, so pretty much the same thing, right? Single event con consumed by many, many sources. Um, and this is the entire premise of, of like Kafka, event first, event driven, 
um, what's called data in motion. Um, so basically your data moves from A to B to C uh, between lines of business. Things happen to it as they need to, and you as an end user like, may not know, but you're effectively, um, your needs are better met. Uh, things happen faster, um, you know, more, more customers, more happy customers, and you, you become uh, more able to predict what your customers will be doing um, in, in the future. Um, one of the things I haven't talked about is analytics. Um, uh, uh, the whole why and when um, thing. Now, the whole premise of Event First is to enable analytics, to make your analytics better. Um, notice how the approach of these processes, right? Basically, you publish, publish an event and something happens as a result of that event. And so in terms of context, when you start marrying this data together, especially things like user behavior um, and things like predictive analysis, predictive analytics. Um, I'll give you a very simple example. We've got a, a customer who uses uh, some of our stuff, um, web application uh, on Black Friday, they have um, like overrun, stock overrun. They started publishing based on user patterns, things of interest um, inside the, the, the click stream of a user on Black Friday. Hey, we noticed you're looking at this. We have this particular item as a stock overrun. It's 70% off or 30% off or whatever it is. Uh, they had a 250% uptake on their stock overrun uh, items. Effectively, they shipped their entire uh, warehouse like of overrun items, things that were going out of, out of sale, stuff that they don't restock um, within uh, days uh, of Black Friday. Um, I'm pretty sure they've published this on uh, the AWS blog. You can go and have a look. Um, it's an AWS and Confluent thing. Um, but yeah, quite interesting. Uh, but yeah, analytics, again, part of the whole thing. But analytics, um, I would ship into the, the metadata part of um, the conversation. Like it's something that assists uh, data as a service. Um, I've tried to refrain from using the word data as a service, but yeah, that's effectively what, what I've been talking about um, for the last 30 or 40 minutes. Um, so there's costs of doing event first. Your data needs to be traceable. You need to have a failure path, which means if you're trying to write something into your data stream and it fails, you need to write it somewhere else and the path of failing needs to be able to be restored. You need to be able to scale. You need to identify where your data came from. You need to version your data. It's like code versioning that didn't exist like 20 or 30 years ago. Your data needs to be versioned. Um, you need to know, you know what version of data you're reading. Uh, auditable, who wrote it, who wrote it where, who did what with it at any given time. Um, I've got scaling three times because it's fairly important. Um, you need to be able to scale because your data will get out of control uh, very quickly, especially if it works like people see it working and they get the value of it, you need to be scalable. Um, decoupling, encapsulation, inverted knowledge, um, evolutionary change and event sourcing. Again, like things like lineage scaling, versioning. Um, inverted knowledge um, is an interesting concept. Basically means like if I read your data, I don't necessarily need to know um, the business domain as in what you're consuming it for, but I need to know what I'm going to be able to do with it and the format I'm consuming. So if I'm consuming a user object, you know, username, user ID, address, blah, blah, blah. This is what I'm expecting to get. This is why you need like a registry of data. Um, go and ask the registry, you know, do you have user data and what format does it come in? And then I can self-service and say, okay, I know what I'm getting. And if there are fields I don't need, I can go to the business owner and say, hey, look, this, this particular object needs this bit of data. Can you publish this into the data stream rather than you know, forcing many different forms of data? It's the one bit, everybody consumes it and they just use what they need from it. Um, similar sort of thing with event sourcing. It's like, I know where it's coming from, I know where it's going to. So look, um, this is kind of, I hinted about this before, like the API versus event driven way. Um, this is the API way. I'll go and get something, I'll ask questions, I'll go and get the data, I'll do something with it and I'll put it back somewhere else. And uh, kind of the old way of doing things. Very uh, inflexible, uh, logic is all buried in here. Um, and it's yeah, not, not real time. Um, I need to be asking for it to get it. Whereas here, you know, Data is broadcast. Whoever wants to use it in whatever format they do within their own business domain, 
Um, if they need to republish stuff back into a stream, they can. People work out what they need to do to do next, like naturally, organically. And queries don't span context. They basically like they use that copy of the object and then they do what they need to, to do with it and then they put it back or they put a new version of it back into the, the data backbone uh, and you broadcast what you did. This is what Kafka is. I haven't used the word Kafka at all because this kind of was supposed to be an agnostic uh, presentation and I hope it came across that way. But at its core, the fundamental principles of why Kafka was built is like this eventing uh, framework. Um, and this is becoming more and more real, right? People are adopting this and have adopted it to, to bigger success. Um, I'll kind of wrap up there because uh, it's late 6.50. Um, more than happy to take questions. Uh, no, good. Right. So another question from like Wang is making it a bit more concrete. Does this make sense? We have a pet food Java microservice with a buy pet API where the transaction stored is stored in a MongoDB, transactional state is stored in MongoDB, the Java service writes to Kafka, by pet event, pet ID quantity. Um, and step Kafka through. updates the, the MongoDB yeah. state. Yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. Um, so uh, it's it's Kafka Connect that would update the MongoDB state, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. But at the same time, like the, your traditional application may still write to MongoDB, Mongo itself can also update Kafka. Um, it's called uh, going. It's called Kafka Connect. It can be both from Kafka into Mongo and from Mongo into Kafka. The only thing is, you got to be careful of things like infinite loops, like recursion. Um, yeah, it's it's a hell of a thing. Um, but yeah, look, that exists. 